Hello, F Sharp. Welcome back. This is our second chat. And as you know, that these are intended to be a more casual conversation that I'm having with you. It's the end of my week. I got through a lot of work. And so there are typically things that are on my mind that I want to unpack with you. Now, the thing I wanted to talk about this week, though, is why do we care about performance? I mean, it's obvious I care about performance. My entire channel is about writing fast F-sharp code. But it's always important to understand the why behind what you are doing. And for me, there are kind of three different key categories that I think about when I think about performance and why I would care about it. And those three categories would be, uh, whoa, let's zoom out of here a little bit uh, and undo that. So they would be resources that I have, the cost, and the capability. And I'm going to hit on each of these in turn. So let's first talk about resources. So when it comes to resources, our programs actually have to run somewhere. They, they physically have to exist on a machine, whether that be a VM or an Azure function or AWS somewhere, but there are resources that are required to run our program. And those resources could be constrained. Now, we live in this amazing time where CPUs now have like gigabit, uh, like I think the latest is that the Zen 4s have just crazy amounts of cache on them. And now with like the Sapphire Rapid CPUs coming and they're going to have high bandwidth memory on them. Like we, we live in this time of computing super abundance. Our, our problem is not the capabilities of our hardware. Our problem is our ability to write programs that run efficiently on that hardware. And there's that joke that uh, whatever uh, Andy Grove giveth, Bill Gates taketh away. And I, I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in a place where that's kind of where we think about computing, like, oh, hardware will, will just keep getting better. And I think that the idea that Moore's Law is dead, like... I think that the, the, the variety of hardware that we are running on and targeting is evolving and becoming uh, more diversified, which is fun, which is very interesting. I really want to see F-Sharp running on GPUs. I know there was the Project Aaliyah GPU back in the day that I was following closely, and I think that website is still up, but I'm looking forward to the day where .NET can start targeting more beyond just CPUs and more varied hardware. But in these other hardware situations, typically your resources are much more constrained. You don't have huge amounts of memory. You don't have tons of DRAM. You don't have giant caches. You may be very constrained in what your program is able to run in. So when it comes to performance, one aspect of performance is just like the size of your program. Like how big is it? Now, that's typically not something that we concern ourselves with in the .NET domain, but that's a very real problem in the real world. And one of the things that C developers are often worried about is like, hey, how big is my program physically? There's also the idea of like how, many, how much energy does that program consume? Like a high-performance algorithm could be high-performance in terms of just not consuming a lot of energy. It's using instructions that are not as energy-intensive as others because... When you're running on an ARM chip or an x86 or a RISC-V, like different instructions will consume different amounts of energy. And so you might be in an environment where like, I care less about the time it takes something to run and more about the amount of energy that it consumes. And so on this channel, we are typically always talking about time, like how fast something runs in, but that's just the one dimension of performance that I personally really care about and really focus on, but there's more to it than that. And so saying something is high performance, like we need to define what performance means in that context. And so if I'm talking to a manager and that manager, leader, whoever, whatever, what you, whatever you call leaders in your organization. And if they ask like, Matthew, why would I care about performance? They're like, well, you know, our programs have to run in limited resource environments, and so they need to be able to perform in that environment. 
So resource constraints, like physical constraints on where my program is running is one of those considerations that I would think of when thinking about high performance. There's another one which is critical and probably be near and dear to many people's heart, and that is cost. How much does it cost to run your program? And this is kind of related with the resources. These, these <laughs> drop the pen. These all kind of play together, and I've kind of artificially created these three different categories, but don't think that like they're very distinct, um, that there's hard lines in between them. So the idea with cost, we... Like I said, we now live in this era of nearly unlimited compute resources because, you know, we have the cloud and we can just spin up more instances. And that's true. But uh, another way to think about that is like, oh, well, we like auto auto balance our resources to meet the demand. Well, that also tells me that you have the capability of spending money very quickly. <laughs> if If you have an inefficient program, but it's fast enough for a hundred users. And then suddenly you get an influx of new interest and that inefficient algorithm is now having to run across hundreds of thousands or millions of users. Your spend just went up dramatically. And so something that may have made sense with only a few users is now incredibly expensive. And the reason I care about this, well, I mean, I care about cost, <laughs> but th this will be the category that will probably most resonate with leadership at your organization. But I have been pretty reliably able to go and look at F sharp code that was written in a very normal F sharp style. And I'm not deprecating normal F sharp style in any way. I'm not saying it's bad. So please don't take it that way. But often, the the simple, easy, straightforward solution in F sharp is not the most performant. And I have fairly reliably been able to at least double the performance of that code. And another way to think about it, doubling the throughput is also having the resources necessary to do that compute. And so if you were able to go to leadership and say like, hey, you know, we're having to use this many VMs or, you know, our Azure functions have this much spend because of how long they run. And you can say like, hey, if you give me a couple weeks uh, or even a month to profile that and I can have our spend, that would be a very compelling argument. Now, I'm not guaranteeing that. And it there's a lot of nuances there in terms of what does your infrastructure look like and how do your resources expand with, you know, increase in users. But there's often a lot of performance left on the table in default F sharp code. And by reducing the resources, reducing the time necessary to run that code, we can dramatically bring down our costs. And so, like I said, I, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I, I have not run across a code base yet where I didn't see some really significant opportunities to increase the performance of that F-sharp code. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying I haven't come across it. Now, we're now going to talk about the last category, capability. And this is probably the one that I get the most excited about, but it's also kind of the most difficult to quantify. And I'm going to need some, I'm going to need some more space here. And I'm now kind of specifically thinking about time. If our algorithm takes a day to run, then that determines the use cases it can be used in. So for example, if you have some statistical analysis that runs on a very large data set, and it takes a day to run, a day to run, that will then determine what the business can or cannot do with that. And so that right there puts limits on what you're able to do. But uh, let me think about this. So like for, okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go to the world that I kind of live in right now. So it's very common for us to have things, supply chain networks. So I have one production plant, I have two production plants, then I have a set of distribution centers. 
DC1, DC2, and DC3. And then I have customers over here. So C1, C2, C3. And I have some arbitrary set of nodes and connections to how I can ship and move material through this network, for example. Now, if I have a simulation of moving material through this network, but it takes a data run, I can't ask that many questions of it. Now, in theory, what we could do is say like, okay, well, Matthew, you could spin up a whole bunch of instances, run them all in parallel. That's true. That's true. But the fact that it takes a day to run tells you that you can only explore so many possibilities. But let's say... So that determines, like, I can only use this analysis very infrequently, and, I'm and because it takes a day to run, I'm only going to use it for questions that are, like, two to three years in length, because by virtue of the fact that that takes the day to run, I don't want to run it that much, and so the questions I need to be asking need to be on a time scale that's much larger. Like, your the time scale of your question... Like, sorry, correction. The time scale of your answer one day will determine the time scale of the questions that are worth asking with that answer. So if it takes me a day to answer a question, to get an answer, then the question I must be asking must be one of years, an example. So, so. And this is kind of in a business sense, and I'm sure we can like break this apart. And it's like, oh, Matthew, that doesn't really make sense in physics or something. But that's kind of in the world that I'm living in and the business process I'm living in, that's kind of the framework. Now, let's say that the time to get an answer has now shrunk down to an hour, right? Instead of taking a day, well, well let's do it even, let's do it. Well, if it's an hour, right? Okay, well, now I can start doing something a little bit more exploratory as an analyst. Like, okay, well, I could run it that same day, look at the results, and then start another run in a day, kind of have like a, a more iterative loop. And I can look at some possibilities and I can see um, some more ideas. And let's talk about this exploration of ideas, right? So before, what I talked about is that, hey, if it takes me a day to run, and this is kind of rough, as you can tell, like these are chats, these are not super polished. So if it takes me a day to run, you can think of like this idea of like running different simulations as uh, like a tree search is essentially what it is. Like, hey, I have my root node, which is the world I live in right now, and I want to explore a whole bunch of different possibilities. And if it takes me a day, if this takes one day, to explore down one branch of this tree. So imagine these are like different simulation scenarios that I want to explore. And I want to see the result of like, this is my reality today here at the root node. And if I took this action, what would my life look like if I take that action? But it takes a day to compute that. So it's very expensive. And so you can't search really deep down this tree because the time to go down a branch is a day of compute. And so what you end up doing is like, yeah, well, I can explore, but you're essentially exploring by going parallel, you're expanding the breadth of the search tree, but you're not expanding the depth. And so what I would much rather be able to do is say like, you know what, what if, and what if this turned into one hour, it takes me one hour to go down one branch of this search tree. Well, now, like, okay, well, now it's a lot, it's worth it to me now to kind of be able to explore farther down this tree because this only means another hour of compute to kind of come a little bit farther down. And so each layer now is a little bit cheaper. And so before we were only to go down one layer in the search tree because it was one day, now we can go down many layers. And so you're, you are exploring deeper possibilities of the future. Okay, that's cool. Now, what happens if this goes down to one second? Or what if it goes down to one 
millisecond. Or, for example, one microsecond. N like your ability to search deeper down that tree, deeper down the possibilities of the future is now going to give you new capabilities that were never possible before. And what I'm specifically thinking about, and I have to be a little coy about this, I was working in an environment where people were having to make decisions about how to invest. And in this case, they were investing in their supply chain, like what to buy or not. And it was a very arduous process. And we came in and automated that and took something that took like hours of work and took it down to a minute. Like they all, all that analysis that they were doing collapsed significantly. And so now what they were able to do is explore more possibilities because like, Hey, I could try this or I could try this. I could try this. I could see the different possible results. Well, if you take that down even further, which is like, okay, well now it takes me a millisecond to compute something. And like, that sounds crazy, but like that type of thing is possible if you are able to push the code hard enough. Now what you can do is run an optimization loop around that and saying like, before I was just being able to run this process and get some result out. Then what I was able to do is I was able to explore a whole bunch of different possibilities and compare, okay, well, which one do I want to do? But then once you go another order of magnitude faster, now you're able to put using something like a genetic algorithm, a genetic search algorithm or simulated annealing, or there's a myriad of other techniques for doing optimization. But once you get into those time scales, your ability to optimize your decision-making process goes up dramatically. And that is, that is what I get super pumped and excited about. Once you take these processes and make the computation incredibly efficient and fast, you're now able to do things that you can never even comprehend before because it took so long to do it. And so that's why I actually get really excited about performance. I mean, resource constrained environments, that's cool. That's important. That's a very valuable thing. It's not what I necessarily care about. Cost is also important. Uh, reducing our resources, redu reducing the amount of energy that we're using in order to help the planet, that's a very valuable thing. But introducing new possibilities of the future, new capabilities for the business, we're like, hey, we we're able to explore and optimize things before that we could never comprehend. And it's because we just didn't think it was even conceivable. And that's, that's where I get super pumped. And it's been like very fun at my current work um, where we've been able to do this, be, be able to do some very transformative work for our clients. And so that has been really fun. And this is what I'm hoping to try to bring to the F-Sharp community that F-Sharp is a fantastic language for doing this type of work because it makes it easy to build something that is correct and robust and testable, but the tools are also there in order to really reef down on the performance and make something that's incredibly fast. And so that's, that's what I get excited about. So sorry for a little bit of meandering today, but I mean, that's the chat. That's the point. I want to do something that's a little less polished and just kind of off the cuff. And so what I would appreciate if, uh, if you could leave a comment, let me know, Hey, Matthew, what is it? what are some things that you would like me to discuss? What are the things that you would like me to unpack and explore? And what are some possible future video series that you would be interested in? I'm in a really fortunate position now where the uh, company that I work with, they, well, we kind of had a discussion and agreed, like they don't really have enough work for me right now, which is actually great because there's a particular type of thing that I like to do. And so they've agreed to reduce my hours while still keeping health insurance. <laughs> so my family is taken care of. But I have a lot more time now to give back to the community, and that's what I'm excited about. And so I'm currently work, uh, looking for projects where you think that my ability, well, where you think writing some fast F-sharp code would be really helpful for you and for your business. So if you're one of those people, please feel free to reach out over email. Uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with me. It's been a real blessing. I hope you found this useful. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.